Hello, everyone. Welcome to the ICNC webinar series. My name is Maciej Bartkowski. I'm the senior advisor at the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict. Uh, there are more than 400 people that, in fact, registered for this webinar. So that uh, clearly shows the, the level of interest in the subject that will be discussed today and the interest, of course, in the speakers who are highly recognized names uh, in the field of civil resistance studies. Uh, together with my organization, uh, ICNC, uh, we are pleased to host Professor Erika Chenoweth and Dr. Maria Stefan that will present the new groundbreaking study on external support to civil resistance movements. Uh, this study is published as the ICNC monograph uh, that is titled The Role of External Support in Nonviolent Conflict, in Nonviolent Campaigns, Poison Chalice or Holy Grail. And I had a great pleasure of working with the authors on this publication as its uh, series uh, editor. And the fruit of their labor is available for free in a PDF a format that can be downloaded, downloaded from the ICNC website. Uh, this study, in fact, is the result of the multi-year research project that ICNC uh, supported to investigate the effect of uh, different forms of external support on the outcomes and long-term impact of civil resistance campaigns. The reason that ICNC decided to support this project uh, was not only because we had an exemplary experience of working with Erika and Maria before, and uh, that work was on the data set known as NAVCO, as well as the uh, highly recognized and awarded book, Why Civil Resistance Works, The Strategic Logic of Nonviolent Conflict. And this experience was certainly a positive and very encouraging sign for us to work again with them, but it wasn't the only or the main reason for our decision to collaborate with Erika and Maria on a new research project. The main reason why we decided to provide a grant support for the, for the new study that will be presented today was the fact that there was little systemic research done on the impact of external uh, support to civil resistance movements. And uh, such limited research was very troublesome uh, for us. Um, we knew, for example, that this issue had been of a great importance to, to activists on the ground. It was also important for democratic actors, uh, both governmental and non-governmental, that uh, contemplate, consider uh, whether and how to support non-violent nonviolent movements. And those activists and actors, they, they want to know what assistance to nonviolent movements works or doesn't, when and how. So uh, we also wanted to provide activists and the democratic uh, allies um, the information, knowledge that can be helpful in countering um, the repressive opponents. Uh, th those, those repressive opponents include also various, uh, various kinds of dictators that uh, brand any external assistance to activists as for interference. And this pact, this bad actors also undertake specific measures um, to inhibit the effectiveness of external assistance. Knowing when and what kind of assistance works best can be in these circumstances very useful um, uh, for activists. We also wanted to support more systemic research on external assistance because the existing studies that look at specific case studies or describe general patterns of external support offered um, somehow contradictory conclusions. Some studies found that external support to nonviolent campaigns is harmful. Other studies show that external support is sometimes helpful. And uh, there, there are also research claiming that external support has little observable effect. So when we uh, decided to support Eric and Maria's research, we were looking for more definitive answers on the effectiveness of external support to nonviolent movements. And uh, we were also interested in what type of actors can provide specific support most effectively. Their research addresses these issues and offers specific responses. Indeed, we agree with external reviewers of the study that their findings are groundbreaking and extremely important to the field and to the practice of civil resistance. They are, in fact, important specifically for those who uh, have one of the most difficult jobs in the world, uh, being a nonviolent warrior for democratic rights, democratic rule of law, and social justice. And the work and findings uh, are equally, in, equally important for those who want to support these warriors as best as they can. So let me introduce now uh, our, our guests, our speakers. Um, first, Erika Chenoweth is the Berthold Bates Professor in Human Rights and International Affairs at Harvard Kennedy School 
and a Susan and Kenneth Wallach professor at Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies at Harvard University. Professor Chenoweth is core faculty at Harvard's Carr Center for Human Rights Policy, where they direct the Nonviolent Action Lab. They study political violence and its alternatives. In 2013, Foreign Policy Magazine ranked Professor Chenoweth among the top 100 global thinkers for the effort to promote the empirical study of nonviolent resistance. Professor Chenoweth is a prolific writer in the field of civil resistance and countering political violence, and the research has been featured in many national print and online media, as well as, as, well as political science blogs. Professor Chenoweth also co-directs the, the Crowd Counting Consortium, a public interest project that documents political mobilization in the United States. So it's a great, it's a really great pleasure for me to have Erica here discussing this new research. Now, our second speaker and co-author uh, of the study that will be presented is Dr. Maria Stefan. Uh, she has bridged the academic policy and nonprofit sectors with a focus on the role and impact of civil resistance and nonviolent movements. Maria is currently uh, a senior advisor for the Horizons Project, a project, a project of Partners Global Institute and hum Humanity United focused on the nexus of social justice and peace building and democracy. She most recently directed a very successful program on nonviolent action in the United States Institute of Peace, overseeing, overseeing cutting edge research and programming focused on nonviolent action and peace building. From 2009 to 2014, Dr. Stefan was lead foreign affairs officer in the US State Department's Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations. She received two meritorious service awards for her work in Afghanistan and Turkey. She later co-directed the Future of Authoritarianism, the initiative at the Atlantic Council. Dr. Stefan has taught at Georgetown University and American University. She is a lifetime member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Similar to Professor Chenoweth, Dr. Stefan is a prolific writer and speaker on the subject of civil resistance, grassroots organizing, and strategic nonviolent action. So it's uh, my great pleasure as well to have uh, uh, Maria with us here. So uh, now how this webinar will go, uh, very briefly, we will first hear from Professor Chenoweth and Dr. Stefan, and then we'll open the, the, the floor, the virtual floor to participants to ask questions. So now without further ado, I would like to ask our guests to introduce their research and present the key findings. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Mache, for that introduction. And thank you to ICNC for organizing today's event. Hello to everyone from around the world. Thank you for joining today. Um, I understand that we have a very cross-sectoral audience, so this should make for a very rich and lively discussion. Um, and, you know, I, I want to really emphasize how grateful Erica and I are for the financial, moral, super editing support that ICNC has provided uh, to this project since its, since its outset, um, and for its earlier financial support for the Novco data set, which underpins why civil resistance works. Um, and, you know, huge kudos to ICNC for its really um, significant contribution to the field of civil resistance. Um, you know, when Erica and I began this project uh, about six years ago, the world was very much in the throes of an authoritarian resurgence. I think we were in the eighth consecutive year of declining freedom scores um, globally, according to Freedom House. And I, I think that actually just today or yesterday, Freedom House uh, released its 2021 Freedom of the World report, which noted significant losses for democracy last year, including in the United States, um, which The Economist dropped from full democracy to a flawed democ a democracy, which may even be generous given last year's attempt to overturn the results of the election, the January 6th insurrectionary attack on the Capitol, and the very real remnants of Jim Crow authoritarianism that persists to this day in the United States. So next slide, Erica. This a major democratic backsliding that has been happening around the world, including in the US, makes even trickier, I think, the topic that we'll be discussing today, which is how outside actors can best support nonviolent campaigns. 
Um, Erica and I did address the topic of external support in why civil resistance works, um, but we used a very blunt measure of foreign assistance. It was very much focused on state support to other states um, and to civil society, so a very binary state-centric indicator that, that we used, which of course, can only tell you so much. So neither one of us was um, especially satisfied with the coverage of external support in that book. We recognize that there's a much wider range of external actors and forms of support that were relevant in many contexts around the world. And although there's been some very good research on the topic of external support to nonviolent campaigns, including, I would note, uh, Hardy Merriman and Peter Ackerman's most recent report on the responsibility to assist, um, there are a number of unresolved empirical questions. Most of the literature on external support has focused on armed conflict settings and support to armed groups, or it's been treated in a top-down way in the democratization literature, or it has focused on transnational solidarity networks, though without a systematic assessment of when external assistance has been helpful or harmful, or it's focused on developing theoretical frameworks about external support to nonviolent campaigns, or focused on explaining a small number of cases. While all incredi incredibly helpful, there were just still a number of layers of the onion that needed to be peeled back. So, and I should say, I was also very personally motivated to go deeper on this topic. Um, as many of the folks on this call know, uh, Erica is the pure academic of this duo, while I very much identify as a member of the policy community. So my last assignment with the State Department involved working with the Syrian opposition in Turkey. Um, I was deployed to Turkey about a year uh, after the popular uprising against the Assad regime began in 2011. Assad, of course, responded to the nonviolent protests with brutal force. And by the time I arrived in Turkey in mid-2012, the nonviolent resistance was being eclipsed by an armed insurgency, which was followed by even more brutal regime responses and a humanitarian uh, catastrophe. And the Syrian uh, tragedy just raised a whole set of questions for me. What, if anything, could have been done differently by external actors, governmental or non-governmental, in the lead up to, during, or in following the mass mobilization? Would it have made a difference? And you know, anyone who thinks there are simple answers to these questions has not worked on the Syrian case. And so with this project, Erica and I were very much motivated to develop a systematic assessment of when external support um, has helped or harmed nonviolent campaigns. And the official kickoff for the project was an ICNC supported workshop at the University of Denver in 2014, where we teased out various approaches and methodologies. And I'll now turn things over to Erica, who's always better positioned to speak to these topics. Thanks a lot, Maria, and thank you, Maciej, and uh, the whole ICNC team for uh, supporting uh, this research and this webinar today. So um, as Maria said, uh, there is a great deal of literature um, that talks about the ways in which international politics are entangled with the domestic political dynamics of any kind of civil conflict. Um, but most of that literature uh, focused on support to armed groups or um, international, even militarized interventions in the context of civil war, uh, democratization processes, uh, and uh, really was kind of more of a state-centric approach. One uh, important exception to this is uh, literature by Catherine Sickink and, uh, and uh, Mar uh, Margaret Keck, who wrote an important book about uh, the impacts of transnational solidarity networks uh, and transnational advocacy networks and um, elevating and amplifying the work of activists and putting pressure on governments um, to respond more effectively to uh, human rights crises. Um, and then there's um, you know, other work by people working in the nonviolent resistance field, people like Veronique Dudaway, Jürgen Johansson, Selena Gaia Cruz, uh, Jamie Jackson, and others who had started to um, uh, develop really uh, important theoretical frameworks or analytical frameworks uh, for categorizing or classifying different types of support, um, for understanding how that support might 
uh, impact movements, uh, and the timing of uh, support on movement outcomes. Um, and I think what we, we did is we sort of classified uh, this really large range of, of materials into, into four categories, um, who we call optimists, pessimists, the uncommitted, and strategic approaches. And optimists uh, are people who actually think that the international community has a really important and effective role to play in uh, supporting nonviolent resistance movements or social movements. Um, pessimists are those that think that basically um, allegations of foreign conspiracy are the political kiss of death, uh, and so nonviolent movements should stay away um, from those types of accusations by not uh, fueling the fire by accepting foreign assistance. Um, then there are those um, academics who believe that this is kind of a fundamentally unanswerable question. Um, the reason being that um, there are strategic decisions that go into supporting particular movements, um, and uh, those strategic decisions to support movements can't actually be untangled from the movement's outcomes. Um, and uh, basically the idea here is that if you're a group like Amnesty International, um, that you actually do go through a series of um, criteria when you're choosing which uh, social movements to support, and you generally uh, try to support movements that you think are already uh, established enough uh, that they can uh, effectively um, uh, make use of the support to, to achieve greater human rights outcomes. And so uh, because of that, it's very difficult empirically and theoretically to disentangle um, who gets supported from who uh, succeeds as a result of support. Um, and then there are those that think about this, I think, the way that Maria and I do, which is more in terms of a strategic approach. This is just a, a frank acknowledgement that uh, essentially campaigns and their opponents are always engaged in strategic act interactions, that this is layered and embedded um, in a broader set of actors that are also uh, strategic in their approaches to political conflict, um, and that basically what, what campaigns need to do um, to, to succeed is that they essentially need to uh, develop power through a couple of key um, uh, challenges. The first is mobilizing popular participation. The second is uh, shifting the loyalty of different pillars of support in particular security forces. Um, and the third is being able to control or deter the state's coercive capacity and abilities and, uh, as the conflict un unfolds. And so um, if, we, if we sort of follow from, from that observation, um, then uh, what we what we argue here is that um, external assistance will support or help movements or benefit movements when it helps them to achieve these important process goals like high participation, um, maintaining nonviolent discipline as regime crackdowns intensify, deterring those crackdowns in the first place, and eliciting security force defections. And we expect that different forms of assistance will have different effects on those uh, processes that are so critical to the ultimate success of these movements. And as a result of that, um, each situation might be somewhat different, um, but we might also be able to observe some generalizable patterns. So what Maria and I did was we, um, we designed a, a multi-methodological study um, that combines um, uh, detailed case studies on different forms of support that, uh, that eight different movements um, uh, received over the, the course of the, the sort of pre-movement period, the movement peak itself and the, the aftermath of the movement. Um, and we, uh, uh, Maria and her team conducted over 80 interviews uh, related to these eight campaigns. Um, four of them we would consider successful movements, at least in the short term, and four of them we considered movements that were defeated in the short term. And then we also collected an original data set on um, instances of external support where the unit of analysis is actually um, the public report of an instance of external assistance. And we define this broadly. It covers um, uh, actually 68, well, it, it covers 73 campaigns, um, 68 of which we, uh, we use in the analysis here. And we paired it with the NAVCO 2.1 data set. Um, and basically what, uh, what the results of that data collection uh, produced was a data set of about 25,000 instances of external assistance across uh, those 73 campaigns during the 2000 to 2013 period. 
And um, the campaigns that we're looking at here are maximalist campaigns, that is campaigns of at least a thousand observed participants that are seeking to um, expel the incumbent national leader uh, or uh, achieve territorial independence. Um, and, uh, you know, those are, again, coming from the NAVCO 2.1 data set, which is a data set that I've prepared with Christopher Shea. So what we were really interested in uh, building on previous research and, and the work that, that we uh, discussed before was uh, collecting these data on a number of different dimensions. So first, we wanted to look at different types of support, different types of supporters or donors, different types of recipients, and uh, different times uh, during the campaign, pre, peak, or post. And so um, in terms of the types of support that we're interested in, Instead of just looking at financial support, for example, we look uh, at monetary assistance, but we also look at moral or symbolic assistance, um, which is, for example, nonviolent solidarity actions like digital campaigning or advocacy, or mobilizing on behalf of the group in one's own country. We also looked at technical assistance. This is assistance with planning, logistics, intelligence, coordination, convening activists, or conducting and delivering background research, et cetera. Um, we looked at instances of training. This is the provision of leadership training, organizational capacity building, labor organizing, uh, nonviolent action or movement training, legal training, and medical training. We looked at nonviolent civilian protection, which is like protective accompaniment or nonviolent interpositioning. We looked at instances in which there were sanctions against the regime that the movement was fighting against. We looked at instances of uh, the provision of safe passage for defectors, for example, golden parachutes, or providing asylum or amnesty to those that want to defect. We looked at instances of preventing and mitigating repression, like providing safe haven for activists or granting asylum or refugee status to them. Um, and then we looked at the removal of support, meaning that um, a patron of the targeted government um, stops supporting them with um, kind of alliance agreements or um, international fin uh, financial assistance. So then we also looked at the donors themselves, the supporter types. And here again, we wanted to collect a wide range beyond just governments and bilateral um, state exchanges. So we looked at international non-governmental organizations, so formal private organizations that undertake activities to assist people elsewhere. So this includes Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, groups like Nonviolent Peace Force, the Fellowship of Reconciliation, um, and foundations and philanthropic organizations, educational or training groups, and adjuncts to religious groups like the Catholic Relief Workers. We also looked at diaspora group support, university or student group support, transnational solidarity networks, individuals, International governmental organizations or IGOs like the UN, the World Bank, the ILO, et cetera, corporations, foreign governments, transnational labor organizations or unions, rebel and paramilitary groups, uh, and media, international media support. And then finally, we were interested in different types of recipients. Uh, so here we were interested in who actually receives the support on behalf of the movement. So we looked at instances in which the support went to civil society organizations, uh, university or student groups, individuals, businesses or corporations, the governments themselves, labor organizations or unions, rebel or paramilitary or militia groups, local media, formal opposition parties, and movement activists. And as we mentioned, um, the main interest here was in really trying to disentangle which types of support um, by which types of supporters to which types of recipients seem to have uh, the, the most um, kind of beneficial impact on different aspects of the movement's process goals. So the big picture is that, um, as one might expect, most dimensions of support have some mixed effects, meaning that they might be positively correlated with one dynamic, like high participation numbers, but they're negatively correlated with others like fatalities at the same time. So in other words, there are some types of support, I think in uh, one of our findings, support from individuals or corporations can actually get a lot of people involved in mass demonstrations, for example, um, but it also um, yields a higher uh, uh, kind of number on average of fatalities. So in other words, it can get people uh, going, but it can't actually uh, provide them on its own 
um, with some degree of um, deterrence against crackdowns. Um, the second thing uh, that really is the key takeaway, I think, uh, here is that external parties that want to support nonviolent campaigns really should be aware of the political and practical trade-offs and the sort of ethical responsibilities um, that that entails. And that, um, you know, it's very useful to sort of look at the empirical record from the last 20 years um, to ascertain uh, which types of support are the most effective without putting people at the greatest risk. So at this point, I'll turn it back over to Maria, who's gonna talk about some of the more specific key findings. Great, thanks, Erica. Um, yeah, and so while there were kind of no generalizable um, kind of principles related to external support, there were a number of kind of key findings derived from both the qualitative and quantitative uh, research. First, um, we found that there has been significant international interest and intervention in nearly all of the cases during this time period, meaning 2000 to 2013. But contrary to what authoritarian governments and even some activists often claim, we found little evidence that external support is necessary or sufficient for the success of nonviolent campaigns. Um, qualitative evidence suggests that financial assistance, diplomatic support, or transnational solidarity is most useful when it leverages good local strategies and networks. So for example, the youth-led Apor movement in Serbia, which uh, began as a self-funded network committed to mass mobilization, benefited from donor support that helped the movement expand their activities. Uh, but to paraphrase Tom Carruthers, external support can only bolster and not create capacity that doesn't already exist. So second, we found that years long investment in civil society and democratic institutions can prepare the ground uh, for successful campaigns. So long-term technical and financial assistance to civic organizations, um, election, election monitoring groups, political parties, think tanks, youth movements, unions, and independent media helped in many of these cases to build the demand side for human rights, uh, civic participation, and government accountability uh, in places like Serbia, Ukraine, Tunisia, and Egypt. And for a number of these cases, I'm thinking specifically uh, Serbia and Ukraine, it was the combination of investment and get out the vote efforts, election monitoring, and mass mobilization that assisted um, in overturning stolen elections. Um, in particular, the support to independent media, I'm thinking B92 Radio in Serbia and support for in investigative uh, journalists in Ukraine played a really important role in countering regime narratives and exposing criminal uh, government activities. Third, as Erica mentioned, training proved to be um, the most consistently impactful form of assistance of, of any that we looked at. Um, and it seems the sharing of skills, frameworks, and know-how for how to effectively wage nonviolent struggle has helped campaigns activate the mechanisms correlated with campaign victory that Erica mentioned. Um, of course, the only way to truly know the impact of training is through randomized control trials, which we did not undertake for this project. But I would note um, that my colleagues Consuelo Amat and Jonathan Pinckney are actually conducting RCTs on training for local activists and peace builders um, as part of a USIP um, project in Tunisia, Nicaragua, and Sudan. But for this study, um, Jean Sharps uh, from Dictatorship to Democracy was cited as particularly influential by a number of activists in different countries and trainings by organizations like Freedom House, ICNC, and Canvas, uh, the Center for Applied Nonviolent Action and Strategies, were cited as particularly influential by many activists. Um, and importantly, I think training serves not only a skills building function, but it also creates crucial convening and peer learning opportunities. Fourth, we found that mitigating regime repression is a critical and I would say undervalued form of assistance that supports an enabling environment for nonviolent campaigns. So for example, during the Orange Revolution in Ukraine, diplomatic intervention by the US, Poland, and the European Union helped to weaken the forces of repression. In Tunisia, military to military channels between the US and Tunisia were used to reinforce diplomatic messages during the uprising in 2011. Um, in a word on sanctions. Um, you know, on the one hand, multilateral sanctions can be an important boost for protesters and can sometimes uh, degrade regime capabilities. 
But often, as we know, regimes can find a way around them, especially when they're kind of unilateral sanctions. And one unintended consequence of sanctions is that it can sometimes make getting material assistance to activists very difficult. And I'm thinking that uh, particularly in the cases of Iran, uh, Sudan, and Syria, where it was actually technically very difficult to get support inside the country. So the fifth major finding um, is that foreign government assistance can strengthen the rule of law during and after campaigns. This is a tricky finding um, in, in, in the study, but we found that support from foreign governments, particularly um, to both bolster uh, local media and organized labor appears to be generally helpful for most campaigns, particularly during the peak mobilization phase. And this is a surprising result that contrasts somewhat with our earlier findings in why civil resistance works. However, the data on foreign government assistance is much more nuanced and comprehensive. So for example, it moves beyond financial assistance and includes nearly 2,000, I think, or so other incidents of non-financial support, diplomatic support, um, efforts to mitigate repression and the like. So, and also a lot of the state support that occurred, occurred in the post campaign period. So a good example of this is in Tunisia, where after the revolution, the interim government, which incidentally was made up of the parties that led the civil resistance that um, ousted Ben Ali, set the sequencing for the transition. And then the US and other governments uh, and multilateral organizations supported it. Um, one bad example, I would say, from the case studies is that after Mubarak's ouster in Egypt, um, the military, the interim military leadership used restrictive NGO laws to target Egyptian activists and civic organizations who had been receiving U.S. aid and other foreign development assistance, which resulted in arrests, trials, and tremendous hardship uh, for many of those activists and their families. So it was definitely one of the cautionary tales of unintended consequences of external support. The sixth major finding was that assistance to armed actors um, undermines nonviolent campaigns. Um, we found, and this has, I think, been um, also determined in a number of other studies, that concurrent external support to armed groups tends to undermine nonviolent movements in numerous ways. It's correlated with lower participation rates, lower chances of maintaining nonviolent discipline, um, and lower uh, probability of eliciting security force defections. Um, so, for example, in the case of Sudan, and again, we were looking at the period of 2011 to 2013, um, interviewees said that weapons and other forms of support provided by various uh, countries to the Sudan People's Liberation Movement or SPLM and Darfuri uh, uh, rebel groups before and during the protests was a setback uh, to the pro-democracy movement. And I think the flow of weapons and money to Syrian armed factions across porous Turkish borders um, helped exacerbate some of the divisions in the opposition and fueled a proxy civil war. Um, we also found that support by armed rebel, rebel groups or paramilitary organizations to nonviolent movements is associated with a decrease in nonviolent discipline, increased campaign fatalities and movement failure as we painfully saw in Syria. So seventh major finding, allied support for uh, repressive regimes poses a significant challenge for activists. Uh, foreign aid from allied governments, particularly when it's used to bolster the regime's security and mis, uh, misinformation apparatus, was a big challenge for activists in a number of campaigns. For example, the Russian and Iranian backing for the Assad regime in Syria and Russia's interventions in Ukraine and Belarus, which included a very uh, savvy misinformation campaign targeting the Zuber youth movement. Um, on the other hand, an ally's refusal to back an abusive regime can be pivotal. For example, uh, Russian Foreign Minister, uh, Minister Ivanov played a key role in Milosevic stepping down in Serbia in 2000, uh, France's removal of support for the Ben Ali uh, regime in Tunisia and its security forces may have been a key turning point in that campaign. And of course, the US government, which was a longtime ally of Egyptian dictator Hosni Mubarak, eventually sided with the pro-democracy movement. Um, eighth major finding is that the jury really is still out on the benefits of direct financial assistance. And I know this is of interest probably to a lot of people um, on, on the webinar, 
Uh, but we found that direct funding to movements actually has few generalizable effects on movement characteristics or outcomes. The only statistically significant findings suggest that direct financial assistance to movements is correlated with fewer participants in the campaign, which is obviously not helpful when it comes to overall success. However, the interviews um, in, across the cases reveal that how direct assistance is provided, as well as who is driving the agenda, influences the impact of that assistance. So for example, in the case of Serbia, the funding for the OPPOR movement by donors like Open Society Foundation and USAID's Office of Transitional Initiatives mostly took the form of in-kind support to pay for office space, uh, equipment, supplies, uh, and advertising that was very much reinforcing of Oppor's own strategy. And by contrast, the donor funding to the Belarusian youth movement, uh, Zuber, and again, we we're looking at the period 2005, six, um, ended up backfiring, creating a lot of jealousies, divisions, and kind of professionalized the activism there, which was not helpful. And actually a remarkable contrast to what we're seeing in, in Belarus today. Um, and you know, in general, there's a lot of uh, literature out on there on this now, but multiple interviews revealed how important flexible donor funding was to help movements be able to adapt, uh, respond to very complex environments. And finally, a uh, ninth major finding is that donor coordination is key. Um, numerous interview respondents, and I can speak from personal experience, uh, point to the importance in, of alignment and coordination amongst donors in their support of movements, which um, doesn't happen um, nearly as frequently as it ought to. So for example, in Belarus, um, Western government's policies and donor support to civic and opposition groups were neither aligned nor coordinated uh, during the Syrian uprising, although there were irregular uh, meetings between ambassadors of the US and other democratic embassies in Damascus. Uh, when the protests began, there was really no uh, donor coordination during the nonviolent protest phase. On the other hand, uh, Serbia and Tunisia, I think, provide very good examples of whether there was extensive and regular uh, donor coordination. And I would flag in the, in the Serbia case, the German Marshall Fund uh, in DC played a really critical role in regularly convening donors, policymakers, NGOs to coordinate their assistance um, to the Serbian opposition. So I think th that concludes kind of some of the key findings. And we're going to spend just a little bit of time on some of the kind of um, recommendations that are derived from these findings. And I'll go over them fairly quickly, at least the first part, so that we'll have plenty of time for, for Q&A. So first, I think the, the study um, definitely suggests that for activists, um, they should be realistic about external support and not make their movements dependent on it. Um, movement actors should set the agenda for external actors and not the other way around. Um, activists need to determine whether and how to accept external assistance, including funding and consultation with other movement leaders that's based on a long-term movement strategy that assesses kind of the, the costs and benefits. Um, importantly, training can help movements plan, develop skills, um, make connections and learn from other activists and movements. Um, training is usually a very good investment for movements. And then importantly, um, the importance of being prepared to engage with media, diplomats, and other officials. Get diplomats to work for you. Be aware of the tools that they have or they could acquire with your input to engage with other governments, um, to facilitate dialogue, to mitigate repression. And I would note here, some of these tools can be found in the Diplomats Handbook and in Maciej Barkowski's uh, great piece, How Democratic States Can Effectively Support Pro-Democracy Movements. Um, and folks can definitely feel free to drop the links in the chat. And then for governments, um, which you know I think might be per particularly relevant for the new uh, Biden Harris uh, Biden Harris administration in the U.S., um, it's just important for governments to treat movements as stakeholders and conflict actors in their own right um, that have their own goals and demands. It's important to listen to activists and movement leaders, invite them to participate in policy fora and high-level diplomatic engagements, and that includes the, su the summit for democracy that the Biden administration is proposing to host. Um, invest in long-term civil society support and institution building but without kind of, um, uh, while well, avoiding the NGOization of civil society. Um, coordination with other donors at policy and programmatic levels is really key. Strengthening the ability of international mediators to effectively uh, engage with movements and governments, particularly during kind of the peak protest period. 
um, and the, prior, the importance of prioritizing the prevention mitigation of violent repression, targeting nonviolent activists and movements using diplomatic means, targeted sanctions, military to military levers to deter and punish security force or para, uh, paramilitary violence targeting protesters. And then, you know, for the U.S. government specifically, since there likely will be more popular uprisings in authoritarian or um, non-democratic settings, I think it's it's really important to designate a lead, a point person to uh, lead the planning and coordination of U.S. government efforts um, in the context of these uprisings, just to give a unity of purpose and some cohesion to the approach. So now Erica, I think, is going to talk uh, finally about um, scholars and NGOs. You got it, you're on it, Erica. No, you're on it. The slide is there, Erica, you're just on mute. Oh. Okay, sorry about that. It wouldn't let me unmute uh, for some reason. Okay, uh, so in terms of the, the practical recommendations for NGOs, one of the interesting findings uh, that came from the correlation analysis is that um, INGOs in particular uh, were one of the sort of least uh, harmful uh, uh, supporters of nonviolent movements. They, they tended to elicit the least uh, kind of blowback against the movement. Um, that said, uh, there, it, it, there's a really important uh, kind of caveat to that, which is uh, for INGOs that are trying to uh, provide support for human rights defenders uh, or nonviolent movements more generally, uh, to do what Maria was just talking about with regard to uh, maintaining a movement mindset uh, where the type of assistance given is timely, uh, flexible if it's funding, uh, that it doesn't require over professionalization of any kind um, with regard to the movement, um, and that the, the local actors uh, and, and folks on the ground are the ones driving the agenda and, um, and describing what it is that they need. But I think uh, one of the most important key takeaways, uh, as Maria noted, is about the, the finding that training um, uh, seems to be one of the most impactful forms of assistance uh, that can be offered. And, and clearly, it's, it's not easy for um, or maybe even appropriate for foreign governments uh, to necessarily be the ones offering training. Um, but INGOs are often positioned such that they are um, appropriate and available uh, to provide these learning and convening spaces that seem to be so crucial for skills sharing, uh, for coordination, for planning, um, and for capacity building. And um, on that note, uh, it can be really important to support further research and education that amplifies histories of nonviolent resistance, since it does seem to be the case that um, peer learning and, um, and learning uh, from one's own country's legacy of nonviolent resistance is an important uh, kind of resource that movements uh, can use uh, to support one another and, and learn about how to be more effective. Uh, incidentally, the, the types of actors uh, on the ground that seem to benefit the most uh, from this type of support include uh, certainly um, uh, civil society groups, but also uh, organized labor, local media, and formal opposition groups. Uh, and so they can be um, uh, particularly supported during these periods and with this type of, of assistance. Uh, and then the, the final thing that really emerged from some of the, the case studies that Maria did um, was the, the, the degree to which um, a lot of support is often concentrated in capital cities where a lot of the kind of important mobilization capacity is uh, beyond. And so uh, it can be very important to, to broaden the aperture of, of um, kind of a geography in terms of uh, who NGOs are interested in interfacing with. And then in terms of the, the sort of scholarly next steps, um, the, the first thing to do is to, I think, certainly expand cases under consideration. As, as Maria mentioned, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we focused here on maximalist campaigns uh, as essentially a convenient sample because there was uh, available data uh, to use to look at the outcomes and processes of those campaigns uh, against the data that we collected from the XD, um, which focused on the, the sources of external assistance. Um, but I think the, the second most important thing to do is to move beyond correlation. Um, uh, all of the findings that we have here uh, in terms of the quantitative analysis uh, 
are emerging from correlation analyses, which uh, show that things are related or associated, but they don't show the direction of the causal arrow. Um, that is that one thing affects another um, and really can't be used for that purpose. So Maria uh, mentioned the, the potential for RCTs. There are also uh, other things like survey experiments or, um, or other types of, uh, of methodologies that can do a slightly um, a more convincing job at uh, establishing the direction of the causal arrow. And that's clearly a direction that, that future research will, will likely take. Um, it could also be very important to evaluate the longer term impacts of external assistance on a broader range of social and political outcomes. For example, um, the, the sort of um, consolidation of egalitarian democracy, um, the inclusivity of that democracy, et cetera. And then the, the final thing that I think is, is growing in interest, uh, certainly um, in, in the scholarship, is, is actually examining the other side of the coin, which is support to the autocratic regimes themselves, um, pro-government mobilization, and uh, the effects of, of that type of support uh, on, on the shrinking of, of civic space for these movements. So with that, I think uh, Maria and I will just um, once again thank everybody who's been involved in supporting this research. Um, uh, and uh, Maria mentioned uh, our thanks to the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict in particular. Um, but I also want to give a shout out to our research assistants, especially uh, Maria Latito, JJ Danflon, Paul Kemp, um, and Patrick McCormick, who were there right from the beginning of the project. Um, and it's Maria, uh, Maria Latito, Maria Stefan, Paul Kemp, JJ Janflone, and me who will. Uh, soon be um, hopefully publishing a working paper that tells everybody more about the XD. Um, that is the data set that we that we use for the quantitative analysis, uh, so that that can be used as a, a resource by other academics down the road. Uh, so with that, um, I think we will stop with our formal presentation, and uh, we're both excited to engage with you and your questions. Yeah, and just want to add on the research assistance, huge thanks to Miranda Rivers, who in addition to Patrick uh, McCormick were a huge help on the case studies, the interviews, background research. So uh, from my side, a uh, big thanks to Patrick and Miranda. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Eric and Maria. Uh, this was extremely insightful, uh, in-depth look into your study and, and its key uh, findings that are so important for both activists and external actors um, who want to support the, the nonviolent movements. Now, um, uh, right now, uh, participants can take a, couple, a minute or so to um, indicate whether they would like to write, whether they would like to ask the question. You can uh, do that by raising your hand, uh, and uh, when we call on you, we'll un unmute you. We'll ask you. To introduce yourself briefly and then ask your question. Um, so we will. Uh, our preference is, in fact, to have a, a live kind of conversation with you. So we would uh, first of all go to those people who would like to ask question live, uh, and then we can also always tap on the questions that were written down. But again, we would like to prefer to hear from you. So please take a moment. Uh, and while you do that. I, I will ask uh, one a general and one specific question uh, to Eric and Maria. Um, and first one was uh, first is about conducting such a such a research. I I think uh, in your presentation um, because of probably the time you really didn't offer to yourself much credit for how much work it took basically to conduct that research and to um, you know provide that that findings. I think it was a gargantuan, in fact, work that that uh, led to to your to, to eventually the outcome that we have here. So I wanted you to ask you to kind of expand briefly on uh, basically on the process of doing that research, uh, both qualitative and quantitative, and how much basically data and information you had to go through and uh, collect in order to produce um, you know the findings that you presented. And my second, more specific question is, in fact. Uh, about ongoing movements, um, and I wanted to take Belarus and Burma as an example, and basically ask you, what would you rec what would be your recommendations to external actors, both governmental and non-governmental actors, that want to support uh, ongoing uh, non-violent movements in those two countries, based on your on your on your findings? 
Erica, do you want to start with the quant and then I'll talk about the interviews? Sure, yeah. So um, thanks, Machi. To collect the quantitative data, um, what we did was um, we had basically a two-fold uh, process. The first is that we selected, you know, these campaigns in which there had, uh, these, these countries in which there had been a nonviolent campaign between the years of 2000 and 2013. We had that list from the NAVCO data. And um, then what we did was um, we looked uh, 10 years before that campaign started. We looked at the peak years of the campaign and then we looked at two years after the campaign. So we added you know, at least 12 years um, pre-post uh, and then had the peak campaign years in between. And then what we did was um, we created a search string in uh, several different news lead services. So um, we, we created, um, uh, and, and this uh, will be in the appendix of the project, but we basically created a search string that our research assistants could go in um, and search for any publicly reported instances of external support um, that was reported in any newspaper, basically during that period um, by any actor. Um, so that covered the publicly reported um, uh, instances in news media. Then we also did um, a supplementary search on each case. So that meant that we read um, in detail any number of writings about each uh, campaign and added in data that wasn't covered in the, in the news reporting. Uh, in some cases, we did um, interviews with activists, um, which led into Maria's project and her interviews with, with um, individuals also yielded some additional observations that we added into the data set. And then we uh, did a search uh, of the uh, aid data project, which is one of the larger um, kind of omnibus projects of all um, instances of uh, overseas development assistance and other types of foreign assistance. Um, and uh, we basically only included those data um, that were uh, explicitly meant to support um, kind of enabling civil society in the pre-period of a campaign. Um, or direct support during a peak mobilization to the campaign. And so uh, through that process, you know, we eliminated something like 95% or more of the US uh, of the aid data um, observations, um, but we kept the ones that were relevant to the scope of our project. Um, and then our research assistants carefully coded uh, each of the 25,000 cases um, by hand uh, with regard to the type of support, the timing, um, and they filled out those criteria for each of them. So as you mentioned, Manche, it was a gargantuan effort and involved dozens of research assistants, um, a lot of uh, coordination by our excellent project managers, especially Maria Latito, um, who is working, I should say, on her dissertation now um, on uh, the question of which, uh, which states support um, different movements and how they kind of coordinate among themselves and coming up with sort of categories of support and, and, and supporters, which is very interesting stuff. Um, but ultimately, uh, you know, what, what, um, what took a long time was, was collecting those data and then cleaning them. We had to, you know, clean each instance to make sure that it was accurate and, um, and that it had been coded accurately and was um, uh, kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for, kind of compatible with the other observations. So uh, it's a big deal to collect data like this. Um, at the same time, it's, um, it, it's observational data. It's largely descriptive. Um, for me, I, I will say something that's uh, basically heretical in, um, in political science today, which is that descriptive statistics are what make the world go around. Um, so we can do a lot with causal analysis, but even just having a baseline description of who's doing what where um, is incredibly informative. And so I'm hoping that the, the data will be an important resource for researchers for years to come. Thank you, Erica. The, the, the qualitative person in me is giving you like high fives for that comment. So thank you. Um, no, and yeah, Marche, it was definitely a gargantuan project. And just briefly from my side, so we can take additional questions, um, you know, uh, together with Miranda and um, Patrick, we conducted around 80 interviews uh, focused on the eight cases. Uh, Serbia, Ukraine, Belarus, Iran, um, Tunisia, Egypt, Syria, and Sudan. And, you know, we acknowledge in the report that it 
it is, you know, um, uh, it's, you know, it was not meant to be a representative sample. It was very much a convenient sample. Um, in particular, we note that it tends to be skewed more to more towards U.S. government officials compared to, uh, you know, representatives of other governments, multilateral organizations, and the like. Although certainly not exclusively, that was mainly due to access um, and, you know, belief that the insights of kind of policymakers who were in the midst of these conflicts would be of, you know, a more general interests. So um, just a lot of kind of interviews and then about perceptions of the support, how effective it was. Also spoke with activists in these campaigns just to get a sense of, um, you know, what type of support was provided and how effective, um, you know, activists themselves thought that it was. So that's a little bit on the on the qualitative side. Um, you had asked about um, kind of specific recommendations uh, for kind of contemporary campaigns, and I don't remember what the two were, but maybe there are other questions related to kind of what's going on in the world today. It was yeah, Myanmar and Belarus. Oh. Do you want us to take that, um, Maciej, or are there other questions coming in from folks? Yeah, we can keep that in mind, uh, that question about Belarus and, and, and b -Rai. I'm sure that there would be some. So. Um, yes, uh, we've got uh, a number of uh, hands that were uh, raised uh, while you were addressing my question. Thank you for actually your your detailed response to that. Um, I will unmute uh, Mahmoud Soliman. Um, and Mahmoud, could you introduce yourself uh, briefly and ask your question, please? Mahmoud, you are self-muted. Okay, um, we'll go to another, okay, I think he, he is coming right now. Okay, Mahmoud, go ahead. No, we still don't hear from him. Okay, I will mute Mahmoud and I will go to another person. Um, Lawrence coming. Um, I'm unmuting you, please, please ask your question and introduce yourself. And I see that you have also said yes. Can yes. you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yes, my name is Laurent Cumming. I'm speaking from um, Ottawa. Um, I'm retired now, but I have a long history of leadership and management of uh, NGOs. And then later in my career as a, uh, a, a consultant, um, I too am interested in the question on uh, Belarus and uh, and uh, Myanmar. I hope you do get to that. But I have another question, um, and that is: um, Do I sometimes fear that we have uh, uh, a tendency to leap too quickly uh, to the question of external assistance? Uh, those of us in the global north, because we sit on a a pile of resources, and we also have a long, long history of uh, international assistance, official, unofficial, missionary, you name it. Um, and um, speaking from some personal experience, I fear sometimes we leap too quickly to the question of external assistance before having really figured out <clears throat> what's going on locally at a long distance um, and what is and what may not be um, a genuine movement. There was, was there a particular question embedded in that or? Pardon? Was there a question that you wanted to address to us? Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, yeah, the, 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 I guess the question really is, um, why did you tackle uh, this book from the point of view of external um, uh, assistance? What, what launched you on the study? Do you want to start with that, Maria? And, and then we can, yeah, why don't you go ahead? 
Sure. Well, I, I mean, I think there was definitely an academic interest knowing that we had insufficiently addressed um, the topic of external support um, in, in why civil resistance works. And there just were a lot of open empirical questions out there. And then very practically, I mean, I must say, I think the question of external support to movements was probably one of the top one or two um, that I was consistently receiving uh, when, when talking about the findings of why civil resistance works. Um, so there's clearly a keen interest to know when it's helpful and equal Equally importantly when it's harmful and so I think being able to go more deeply and to kind of explore a range of different external actors governmental and non-governmental was definitely an impetus and you know we've all like lived through most recently the Arab Spring um, you know the current kind of uprisings and certainly what's happening in Belarus and Myanmar and it's a very I think important question what types of support are helpful during different phases of a movement um, and when can it actually undermine Mind the overall effectiveness of movement. So there was a very practical, I think, impetus for wanting to learn more. I mentioned the story of Syria just because it was such a, you know, a complicated and ultimately tragic, um, you know, campaign where wanting to learn more about what, actor, you know, external actors could have done differently, um, if anything, I think was definitely kind of a personal motivator, but Erica likely has her own as well. Yeah, I mean, thank you very much, Lawrence. I think um, I think Maria and I probably broadly agree with you. Um, and if you read this um, monograph, uh, what you'll find out is that we know a lot more about what not to do than what to do. Um, and for example, I think it's a pretty important finding um, that providing even um, non-lethal assistance to armed groups, for example, um, could actually really undermine um, a, a nonviolent opposition movement. Uh, in the context of a crisis. Uh, I also think that um, that there's a really important finding in here about the reality that um, that the sort of international architecture is not really well set up to uh, provide people with the types of skills, um, exchanges, and, and peer learning opportunities that they need to be effective, but that we're getting there. And there are definitely some uh, groups and organizations that have been um, experimenting with this type of thing and, and are probably having um, really important impacts and uh, supporting people who are trying to liberate themselves. Um, and I would also say that um, that I'm pretty, uh, you know, our first book really did try to answer this question of how people people basically liberate themselves um, using nonviolent resistance and comes out on a pretty skeptical note that, um, that the external um, kind of dynamics of this um, can be productive in that kind of context, particularly when you're, you know, facing down um, pretty brutal authoritarian regimes. And, and I think Maria and I were both also fairly disturbed by this growing narrative um, that's being pushed by a lot of different autocratic governments that all nonviolent movements are essentially foreign conspiracies, and that, um, you know, that actually is picking up and does have um, uh, a lot of political power in a lot of contexts, particularly when you know, the US or uh, the West or the global North is, is basically uh, pegged as the culprit when there's a domestic political crisis. And um, I think if anything, um, this study helps to provide both um, some descriptive data about the fact that there, there, there is an international dimension uh, to many of these nonviolent resistance movements but it is definitely not the most important one, and it's not the it's neither necessary nor sufficient on its own uh, to explain you know how these movements un unfold and whether or not they succeed. And so you know we can we can clearly push back on um, that pretty damaging narrative that gets a lot of people um, in really thorny political um, trouble in their countries um, when uh, when they're you know seen to be trying to interface with activists from a neighboring country, for example, about um, how they can protect themselves and, and, um, and move forward with regard to their demands for human rights. So, so I, I, as I said, I think we broadly agree with you. And, and I think our response to, to your question, Lawrence, also helps to illuminate how I think we'd respond to Maciej's about uh, Myanmar and Belarus, which is, you know, this, I think to me, the, the most important and potentially um, influential uh, finding that we have that we have a lot of confidence in is the importance of training and skill shares. And so for me, um, these days, if somebody asks me, what can I do? Um, uh, 
you know, I'm, I'm less inclined to say, well, lobby your own government to, you know, put sanctions or something. I'm more inclined to say, well, honestly, like there's people need skills and information and, um, you know, we need to develop more ways uh, for people to be in touch with one another about that. And the fact that India is just uh, put in jail a, a young woman for trying to share skills and information um, with her fellow um, uh, activists uh, in, in the, the farmers' protest shows exactly that, um, that skills and information are really threatening uh, to regimes that are trying to crack down on human rights. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Maria and Erika. Uh, I will unmute uh, Consuelo Ahmad. Uh, Consuelo, you can you can go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Erica and Maria. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. It's good to see you, and uh, thank you for such an amazing study. We've been waiting for this for years, and I am thrilled yeah. to be able to get to see the data set <laughs> when you um, make it available. So just congratulations on such an amazing and monumental and important work. I had two questions. One is pretty quick. Um, number one is, are you coding um, assistance external to the movement or just international assistance? So, so do you mean external? So for example, a domestic actor that's external to the movement, are you counting those or just um, international actors? And then number two is, I'm really curious about um, more details about your finding about trainings. So why do you think it um, has been so effective and, and predominantly effective and, and not so much having uh, trade-offs? So can you speak a little bit more about like intermediary outcomes? For example, do you observe that after trainings, people engage more in strategic planning uh, and engage more in kind of thinking about uh, scenarios about repression and practicing kind of um, activities and those kinds of effects? Or do you find people for example, having more nonviolent discipline because they now buy more into the idea that maybe nonviolent non action can work. Uh, do you think that it's more about lessons, specific lessons learned and kind of having more imagination about tactical diversity? So there's lots of like intermediary outcomes that may come about from trainings. And so I'm just curious to see from your interviews and from the data what you can tell us about that. Thank you so much. Uh, great. Thanks, Consuelo. Um, Maria, maybe I can take the first cut at this. So. Uh, for your first question, don't look at like domestic coalition formation um, uh, as such. And then on your second question, um, there's a we have some discussion of this in 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 the in the monograph. Uh, there's a figure on page 67 that that shows that um, when movements have uh, higher numbers of uh, of training um, before a movement sets on. Um, we observe a couple of things uh, when the movement is underway. The first is that they, they tend to have higher peak participation than average. They tend to have a higher probability of eliciting security force defections than the average movement. They have a greater ability or capacity, it seems, to maintain a nonviolent discipline. And there are fewer fatalities than average. So what does this mean? I think it's sort of like what you said, Consuelo. I think that um, probably what happens is that they encounter a theory of change and um, that they likely have more of a strategic capacity to sort of um, target their activities in a way that act out that theory of change. Um, I can't prove it, um, but uh, that's what I would say uh, based on this, this descriptive finding and some of what uh, Maria uh, found in her qualitative cases, but Maria, over to you. Yeah, um, definitely um, was hearing from interviews with activists, and I'm thinking of a number of examples from Ukraine, even failed cases like Sudan and Belarus, kind of the, the training was cited as just giving confidence that there is a way forward and kind of learning from other cases. And so, you know, one really good example of this is how the Egyptian Kafaya movement kind of was learning tactically ideas, um, you know, from Oppor and other movements. And of course, you know, it's sometimes not often not a good idea to 
you know, try to, um, you know, reinvigorate the same tactics or to do a cut and paste, but sometimes it just jiggers the imagination about ideas of how to kind of adapt tactics locally that just gives ideas, um, which helps to expand the tactical repertoire, encourage different forms of, cooper um, of participation. So I think that's definitely part of it. And just, you know, authoritarians thrive on the sense of disorientation and like the sense of powerlessness that we can't do it kind of thing. And and I think, you know, often these exchanges are important both to give a sense that there are means and also to create space to build trust and relationships, which is so critically important to build kind of the organization and the infrastructure of movements so that they can sustain themselves kind of beyond, you know, the expected repression. So that's, you know, those were some of the things that were coming up in the in the interviews. Thank you. Um, next. Uh... Uh, person who would like to ask the question is Elena Quilly. Uh, Elena, I will unmute you and please ask your question and introduce yourself briefly as well. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I hope you can hear me. Yes. Um, thanks so much for the presentation. It was very interesting. Um, and I'm really interested in um, also like looking at the situation in Myanmar at the moment. Um, on the one hand, have you also looked at like individual actors or like people abroad individually because I've, I have the sense that there's a lot of like individuals abroad at the moment trying to do something and you were speaking about like um, voicing solidarity and like kind of sharing the information maybe um, internationally so what can be done uh, in this regard um, in support um, on the one hand in the in the short term but also on the long run to um, to support um, non-violent movements Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, one thing, I, I don't know if you were referring to diaspora members when you were talking about individuals abroad, but I mean, there's, you know, probably one of the best examples of kind of um, impactful diaspora support was in the Su Sudan case. So the role that Sudanese activists played in, um, you know, translating materials and like just spreading the word about what was happening during the uprising, giving details. The translation, though, was particularly important. And I think, you know, there's a lot of work that can be done to continue to translate what's happening, you know, in Myanmar uh, for different audiences. Um, you know, I, I think. Um, Here's a case, too, where I think uh, kind of diplomatic support, you talk about individuals, but individual diplomats can also make a big difference and kind of especially coordinated diplomatic um, actions. And I haven't been seeing if there have been kind of um, kind of physical um, diplomatic interventions or attempts to mitigate repression, but I think particularly in this moment, like the physical presence and like the coordinated statements and approaches are really um, critically important. So those are, I guess, a, a few things that immediately come to mind. Yeah, I think the way that we defined individuals um, in the data collection was that, you know, it was somebody with, with some kind of um, a high profile, like a Nobel Peace Prize, a laureate or something like that who was sort of speaking on behalf of the movement. Um, but if it's an individual that's associated with the diaspora group or a transnational solidarity network or a student group or something like that, we usually categorize them as that. Um, uh, and and so it's hard to sort of disentangle, um, you know, what an individual can do uh, from from our data collection. Um, but, uh, but what I would say is that, um, you know, uh, an effective way to get involved is to try to find out um, whether there are some kind of um, kind of transnational solidarity networks that are emerging and to just stay abreast of what's being asked um, by people on the ground uh, and to, you know, certainly vet um, that information, uh, validate that information and triangulate it across a few ways uh, to make sure that it's legit. Um, and uh, and then to sort of uh, think about whether it's something that that you feel you can do. But um, but yeah, I mean, I think I think that um, uh, in terms of uh, the the role of individual individual actors like celebrities or Nobel Peace Prize laureates, we didn't find uh, very consistent evidence that that their uh, sources of support were having uh, broadly positive impacts on the movement. Um, and I, I think part of this might be because of kind of reverse causality, which is you start to get a lot of attention from people like that when things have already started to go badly for the movement. 
Um, so, for example, if you have um, Nobel Peace Prize laureates come, you know, speaking out against abuses, the chances are the abuses have begun, and and so you're already in a situation where you have higher fatalities, and it's difficult for an individual to make a difference, um, and in their own capacity. Um, but um, but you know, I, I think that. Um, like I would say before, training seems to be really important. There are a number of different training organizations out there, um, even elevating information about their presence um, and uh, ways to get in touch with them, I think can be helpful. Yeah, the only thing I would just add quickly is probably the Iran case. The Green Revolution has the best examples qualitatively of the role of individual artists. So especially after kind of the, the murder of Neda Sultan that was kind of, um, you know, broadcasted on BBC, there was a lot of, there were like, you know, concerts and like, you know, Bono was speaking out, U2. And so it was really actually a moment that brought a lot of celebrities together. But, you know, assessing the overall um, impact of that is, is pretty difficult. Thank you. Um, I have Ben Neymar Rose um, who wanted also to ask a question. Ben, I'm unmuting you. Please introduce yourself and ask the question. Great. Thanks. Thanks so much, Maciej and Eric and Maria. Um, I echo Consuelo's comments. Thanks, and the research is fascinating. And um, as you know, I think it's super important. Um, right, so I have, I have two questions. The first is about um, non-publicly reported um, support. Right, so what what might your hunch be about how much external support um, happens that uh, might be missing from the data because it's not public? Um, and secondly, what's your sort of hunch about how the effects of non-public support might differ from reports from support that ends up in you know in the BBC and CNN and in, in local media? Um, and then the the second is the, a question about power. Um, and you, you sort of mentioned the importance of outside actors taking a movement mindset and developing flexible funding mechanisms, coordinating with each other. Um, but outside support can lead to what right, some scholars call movement capture, right? Where they, they sort of directly, indirectly influence um, uh, the movement goals or activities. And it can occur in gradations, right? And maybe even occur unintentionally when donors seek consensus, right? Between the goals, strategies, tactics of the movement and their donor priorities. Or, the, or governmental politics, um, and that those sort of things might re reinforce power imbalances between the outside actors and movement actors who might be from minority groups or already living in an authoritarian setting and sort of um, seeking power and such. So, so I'm curious what sort of recommendations or advice you would have from the data and the conversations with movement leaders for folks who are offering or thinking about how to offer external support, about how to avoid sort of inadvertent movement capture. Sure. So maybe on on that last point, I mean, it's a very um, good point. And again, goes back to who's setting the agenda. And there really was kind of a, a stark difference that came out in, in the interviews um, when it was very clear that it was more about the donors and kind of their priorities and when it was very much led by movements. And so, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, being able also as a donor to be able to listen to different perspectives, it kind of relates to Lauren's initial point about not knowing the context. And sometimes donors can pick favorites and kind of focus, um, you know, attention money on certain individuals. And that can create divisions. It can, you know, these individuals can be like not representative of the movement. So I think, you know, emphasizing the listening to many different parts of the movement is really critical for, um, you know, for a donor perspective. Perspective. And when it comes to money, I think this is where, like, you know, red flags should be going up if kind of movement actors are asking for a lot of money um, in the way that, you know, kind of NGOs would be asking to sustain their operations. And so generally, you know, kind of legit um, activists are going to be asking for very specific needs that they have as part of their mobilization and sustaining it. So I think, you know, the important message that like lots of money is not always the answer and some, can sometimes be very um, detrimental is definitely 
Um, you know, one point, I would say one of the best examples of what activists regarded as very effective um, kind of private foundation assistance was in the Sudan case where it was OSEA, so Open Society in East Africa, providing very kind of um, no strings attached, uh, very flexible grants to the Sudanese activists, providing computers, things like that. So those types of support were kind of consistently um, helpful for activists in the activist perspectives, at least. And Erica, you can speak to kind of the quantity of um, potential private support. Yeah. So we have no idea um, how many non-reported incidents of support there are. Um, we had, you know, uh, Cassie Dorf uh, did some interviews um, related to the sort of larger uh, project um, with uh, Serbian activists. Um, and, you know, I think in, in the aftermath of, of her interviews, um, we found that most of what she was able to uncover was also in our data, like it had been reported somewhere or the other, like in case studies about the case or whatever. Um, so there is some degree of um, benefit of looking at historical cases to collect the data about which others have already written so that we could, you know, basically use um, what was known, even if it wasn't in the papers or something like that. Um, that said, beyond that case, we don't really have uh, too many um, too many chances to do any kind of cross validation against um, you know missingness related to um, uh, pro you know covert or, or privately um, uh, transferred support. Um, I don't know if I have too much of a hunch about uh, how it would affect things because I think it could cut both ways. On the one hand, um, you know there are really good strategic reasons um, for discretion. Um, at, for a movement, particularly in its early phases, um, for being kind of under the radar and for supporters to also fly under the radar. So you can imagine that there might be some important, um, at least tactical um, reasons for that um, in a lot of these settings. At the same time, um, once if a movement emerges out of, um, out of some kind of training, for example, or convening, um, it can be really dangerous for there to be revelations of uh, something that looks like an international conspiracy or or something like that. And so um, uh, I think that it really depends politically on what's going on and what this, the circumstances are for the, the movement and whether the setting is one in which those types of narratives really tend to resonate and benefit the, the incumbent regime. So for example, um, Nicaragua is not one of the cases that's in our data set here, but if you think about like the, the two tails of the Nicaraguan blue and white revolution of 2019 or 2018, um, this was a case where, you know, um, Ortega, the Ortega regime's um, uh, narrative about this was that it was capitalist encirclement as usual. It's the U.S. fomenting, you know, an uprising. It's, you know, the, the basically the, the pro-U.S. factions, the right-wing factions within the country that are trying to destroy their revolutionary project. And um, the proponents of the blue and white revolution are saying we're human rights defenders, we're pro-democracy activists. This is a, you know, a regime that's committed major human rights violations and led the country into total crisis. Um, we uh, media corporations had received some support from USAID or whatever, but there's no way that you could call this an, an international conspiracy. And so, you know, uh, I think in, in, in that context, like having um, having the the existence of a credible um, argument that there was some kind of like foreign intervention on behalf of the movement does create like a massive political boon to the Ortega regime. In, in other cases, um, you might not have that much of a like ready-made uh, narrative that is very convincing to a, a broad proportion of the population. And so there it might be less risky, but I think it, it really depends on, on the context. I think we probably need to wrap up there, right? Yes, yes, we do. Um, I mean, there are a number of hands still raised. Um, um, if you don't mind entertaining one more question, we can uh, we can we can do that. Um, and um, so let's uh, let's just uh, have one more question, and we'll be concluding the the webinar. Um, 
I would like to ask Katarzyna Przybyła. I will unmute her to ask her question. Katarzyna, please go, please go ahead. Yes, I hope that you can hear me. So my name is Katarzyna Przybyła and currently I'm the supervisor of International Peace and Conflict Studies uh, program in Warsaw, Poland. So I have basically two questions. Definitely I was looking forward to your presentation, first of all, because I'm teaching a course on nonviolent resistance and students are asking questions about the role of external support, but also because of the fact that there are lots of myths around external uh, support in general. So my first uh, question, this is a quick question. You mentioned the importance of training, uh, but what kind of training? If there are differences, in, uh, for example, that ed is ed education included uh, in training when you talk about training or you talk more about teaching, you know, the participants of the tactics and strategy, et cetera. So that's my first question. And the second one is, more from a policy level, because I worked in the National Security Bureau of Poland and I was an analyst on the former Soviet Union. And we had lots of talks about what kind of support is necessary when thinking about Russia, Belarus, etc. And if it's important, um, if the relations between the countries are good or bad, let's say if you know your country, your government want to support the movement. Um, is it, you know, is it important if you, your government uh, has good relations with the government um, that the participants are opposing or it's not important? Have you checked that when you were analyzing? Maybe it's better, you know, to get support from countries that are more neutral. So these are the uh, questions, especially, of course, connected to the current situation in Russia and Belarus. Thanks a lot. Sure. Um, well, I mean, Erica, you can speak specifically if that was um, kind of specific, uh, um, if it was government support, if they were allied uh, allies compared to non-allies when it came to like removal of support and the effect of kind of bilateral support in that sense. But my sense is that there's a lot more um, leverage when it is a USG ally in many cases. So, you know, think about, you know, US government being allied with the Mubarak regime, um, you know, for many years and then essentially siding with the movement eventually um, was very impactful compared to say the US sanctions regime on you know Assad you know Assad or um, you know uh, in the case of Belarus uh, arguably sanctions are kind of less effective unless they are multilateral in the light in, in the in that sense so I think it does matter if, whether it's an allied relationship or not also, I mean, Erica mentioned the Nicaragua case, and it is really tricky from an external support uh, perspective, because I think when there is a history of U.S. intervention and kind of, you know, Cold War and beyond, it makes it tougher to overcome the accusation that it's kind of foreign backed, whatever. It's not impossible, but it makes it um, very difficult. So I think the history of the relationships between the countries is, is particularly important um, on training there was actually a range of different types of training and it, everything from you know strategic nonviolent action civil resistance to media training democracy training um you know erica can speak to the broader range peace ed i mean to the extent that i imagine conflict resolution was woven into some of the like how to form coalitions how to organize you know my personal belief is that integrating more kind of peace building conflict res in traditional nonviolent action trainings is important and helpful to kind of resolve internal kind of disputes and conflicts within a movement, um, but I don't know the extent to which, you know, the training captures all the peace ed that's out there. So Erica, do you want to give us a sense? I think Maria answered that great. And I, the, the only thing I would say is that we didn't actually uh, do any kind of uh, descriptive or correlation testing between the, the types of states um, that were, or, you know, the type where the, where the actors were located who engaged in supporting and and, and uh, the sort of dyadic relationship between them. Um, this is something that Maria Latito is looking into somewhat with her dissertation. Um, so stay tuned for that, I think. Um, uh, but what Maria said is my intuition as well, which is um, there's always gonna be more leverage if the states are relatively more uh, aligned with one another than when they're rivals or when they have like totally frozen diplomatic relationships. So this is why for example, what Russia decided to do around Syria was more important than what the United States decided to do around Syria. 
Um, that said, um, uh, as as we have discussed, like patrons or, or um, powerful countries that are supporters of other countries, um, if, if the countries that they're supporting are the ones who are up against um, a nonviolent campaign, um, then that the 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 supporting country, uh, their behavior can make a big difference. So I think the the sort of uh, iconic example of this is Ronald Reagan's government sending a senator to uh, speak with Ferdinand Marcos and the People Power Revolution in the Philippines in the 80s, saying that you know the United States is not going to back you up if you decide to, you know, um, crack down on thousands of nuns um, in Manila, like we're just not going to support that. And Marcos deciding that he'd lost the generals and now he'd lost his the backing of the U.S. Uh, government. And so he was going to leave and go to Hawaii on a helicopter or whatever. So, so um, you know, that this is um, this is an example of, of where you have a powerful actor that removes support. And uh, so one potential implication of that is if there's an arrangement in which there there are um, kind of indirect relationships, so if the U.S. have has leverage with that powerful country, um, that that can be an indirect way um, in in the case of the United States uh, for there to be some potential indirect leverage. Thank you. Um, I would like to thank both of our guests uh, for for the excellent presentations and uh, presentation and the insightful responses to the questions uh, it's always a pleasure to listen to 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 each of you and having both of you on uh, uh, to present was uh, was a, was a gift to us so uh, once again thank you so much for um, for the presentation of your study uh, this webinar was recorded and will be posted online on the ICNC uh, website in the coming days and we will also distribute the link to the recorded webinar to those who uh, registered for it. So thank you again to everyone for tuning in. Please stay safe and uh, we hope to connect with you again very soon.